Johnny Dollar. Hi, Johnny. This is Harvey Wakeman. Well, Harvey. You know, it's State Unity Life down here in New York. Sure, I know. How are you, Harvey? Great, Johnny. Just great. But listen now, I got me a problem. Well, you're not alone in that. Or rather, one of my clients has. Ever hear of a man named Thomas Rayburn Morgan? No, I don't recall Oh, I guess you'd have no reason to. He's a broker, Johnny. A stockbroker. Has his own little office over in New York, NJ. Well, what seems to be? Well, I'll tell you what. He called me up on the phone a couple of minutes ago and told me that he needs you, Johnny Dollar, right away. You and nobody else. Did he tell you what his problem was? No, he didn't say what's bothering him. Not the slightest hint, but he did make it plain there's no time to wait. Well, unless I have some idea... So I promised I'd call you right away, so I've called you, so his office address is 13827 North Commerce Street over there in New York. Harv. So grab your hat and get on down to see him, okay? Now, Harv. Meantime, I'll give him a call and tell him to stop worrying you're on your way. Now, listen, will you? And if you're a good boy, Johnny... Harvey, will you shut up long enough for me to get in a word edgewise? What? What's that? Well, sure. <laughs> Go ahead, Johnny. Don't get sore. I said... It's just that he's a very important client, so anything we can... Do. I said that unless I have some idea just what this man Morgan wants me for... Johnny, but... Johnny, boy, didn't you hear me? I haven't got the least idea what's troubling Mr. Morgan. Well, maybe I better phone him myself. No, 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 no. There is no point in calling him. He'll only say to come and see him, and he'll tell you what it's all about himself. Well, then I'm sorry, Har, but these blind assignments for the birds. You tell him I'm not interested unless I can find out exactly... And I'll tell you this, too, Johnny. Considering the size of all the policies we've written for him... No, Har... I mean, considering the way that guy is loaded, considering that when I call him back and tell him you're on the way... No, now listen. But that a guy like you comes high and that you have to be sure of a nice big extra fee. Fee? And Johnny, when you see how generous he can be when he wants to. <laughs> well, well, Johnny boy? You said fee? I said fee. And doesn't the sound of money, and I mean a lot of it, doesn't it kind of make these silly questions of yours, um, unnecessary? Well, Johnny? <laughs> What's your guess? Okay. 13827 North Commerce Street, Newark, New Jersey. Thomas Rayburn Morgan. Right. I'm on my way. The CBS Radio Network brings you Bob Reddick in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the State Unity Life Insurance Company, New York City office. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Lone Wolf Matter. Expense account item one. Well, as long as Mr. Morgan is supposed to be such a generous soul, call it $30 even for the plane to Newark and a cab to the brokerage office on North Commerce. Mr. Morgan turned out to be a friendly, distinguished, prosperous-looking man of about 50. But he also looked more than just a little worried. Uh, sit down, Mr. Dollar. Sit down, please. All right, Mr. Morgan. Thanks. Uh, no, no, no. I'm, I'm the one to say thanks. I mean to you for coming here. Strictly speaking, this is not an insurance matter. But to tell you the truth, you're the only one I know of who might be able to help me in this situation. Now, why is that, sir? Well, I, I, I mean, help me with a proper regard for its confidential aspects. You see, I, I haven't dared to contact the police about this matter, not even the authorities down there in Philadelphia. Now, why Philadelphia? Well, that's where the letter came from. And what letter is that, Mr. Long? You see, if the facts were to become public knowledge, well, it could mean only one thing. Complete and utter ruin. Not only for me, I, I don't care about that, but for my family, my wife and two splendid young sons. I suppose you tell me what it's all about, sir. But I must be sure, absolutely sure, that I can depend on you to, to keep this completely confidential. Believe me, I'll pay you well for it, very well. Just go ahead, sir. All right. Here, read it for yourself. Okay. Dear Thomas, or should I say Danny Fairland, Danny Fairland. That was a name that I, I used when I was younger, and I... Uh, but, but read on, please. All right. You may be surprised to hear from me after all this time. That doesn't mean I haven't I kept, kept myself... kept myself well informed about you. Ever since that day some years ago, when our little investment scheme 
to the sizable sum of money from a handful of gullible suckers. You've done well, Thomas. I am sure your share of the money is what started you so nicely in your present business. Is that true, Mr. Morgan? Just, just read on, please. All right. However, I was somewhat, somewhat less fortunate. fortunate. And especially recently, things have gone very badly for me. But I am certain you will be only too glad to help me out. Let us say, for the sake of our old friendship. And because so far, I have never revealed the details of our illicit enterprise to the authorities or anyone else. After all, I fully realize that such a revelation, just what such a revelation might do to you, my friend, to your business, and of course, your nice family. Now, in view of your being in a position to help me, what I suggest you do is this. Make a couple of withdrawals from your bank account in cash until you have, say, your $10,000 on hand. For a man of your means, this shouldn't be too difficult nor take very long. I'll contact you as to where and when you may deliver this money to me. It's out and out blackmail. Oh, read on, sir. One other thing, being a man, man of, of conscience, conscience and having... Having been always afraid that sometime I might die without opportunity to get a crime off my conscience, I have carefully written it out in all detail, including, of course, your part in it. I have given this to a friend in a sealed envelope. Needless to say, should anything happen to me, any uh, trouble of any kind, this friend would immediately turn it over to the newspapers. Do you see... Thomas, I shall call you shortly, there at your office, rather than needlessly bother your fine, fine family, family, your, your old, old friend, H.B.W. Well, that's very neat, Mr. Morgan. Neat, Mr. Dollar. And just who is H.B.W.? His name is Henry B. Wolfe. And this crime he talks about? A most reprehensible stock swindle. But I was young and inexperienced when he proposed it to me. It... It simply looked to me like an easy way to accumulate money enough to start this business. And I thought without hurting anyone. But it was wrong, and we took thousands from innocent people. Then aren't your skirts just as dirty as his, Mr. Morgan? Well, no, not, not quite, Mr. Dollar. Well, I mean, except for this blackmail bit. No, no. Because at the time, I kept a list of all the people we'd defrauded. And then later, anonymously, I paid them all back with considerable interest. Why anonymously? Oh, good heavens, man, don't you see? If what I'd done would have become known, don't you see what it would do to this stock brokerage business of mine? It would ruin me. And far more important, though, it would needlessly hurt my wife, my family. It kind of looks as though he has you over a barrel, doesn't it? This man, Wolf, has nothing to lose, and you have plenty, and he knows it. What can I do, Mr. Dollar? What can you do? You know something, Mr. Morgan? Yes. That's a good question. Johnny Dollar's adventures take him to many out-of-the-way places around the world. CBS News takes you to every corner of the globe, where trained reporters are constantly on the alert to bring you accurate accounts of what happens the very minute it happens. You can always count on CBS News to be first and most accurate with the news. Hear expanded CBS News on CBS Radio every hour on the hour every weekday. It's your clue to what's new everywhere. We'd also like to remind you that today begins National Hospital Week. During the year, one out of every eight Americans receives some type of hospital care. In addition, your community hospital stands ever ready to serve you in case of a disaster or an epidemic. It is the training center for doctors, nurses, and medical research scientists. Your community hospital needs and deserves your support. You can give that support not only financially, but also by serving as a hospital volunteer and by encouraging the young people in your community to enter health careers. Remember, your hospital is a community partnership. <laughs> Morgan convinced me that he was telling the truth. That his ex-pal, Henry Wolfe, had engineered the stock swindle some 25 years before. That he himself had made complete restitution. And then some, for his part in the affair. But how to locate this Henry B. Wolfe? The only helpful information on that letter 
was a Philadelphia postmark, and Philadelphia is a pretty big town. But he said that he would telephone me, Mr. Dollar. Yeah, I know, and tell you where and when to hand over the 10000 Now, have you done that? Done what he told you to? Drawn the amount from the bank? Well, what else could I do? If I set the police on his trail, if he's arrested and jailed, his friend will release the sealed envelope to the press and I'll be ruined. And if I myself try to, to stop him in any way, I, I mean, when I deliver the money to him, the same thing will happen. Stop him? You mean by putting a bullet through him, something like that? Believe me, if it weren't for my family, Mr. Doc. Oh, no, 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 I don't mean that. I just couldn't do a thing like that. But what can I do? Just pay him off is what it looks like, doesn't it? Ten thousand dollars? That's right. And when he runs out, another ten thousand, and another, and another. <sighs> He'll have the same hold on you in a year, in ten years, that he has right now. Then you must do something to stop him now. And you must do it now. Okay. How's about letting your secretary go out and pick me up a handful of magazines? Magazines, Mr. Dollar? What for? Well, Wolf said that he'd call you here at the office, didn't he? Yes, he did. So right here is where I'm staying. But, Mr. Dollar, I... Any better ideas? Until we find out where and when and how he wants that money? I see. And when we do? That depends. Now, how about her getting me a stack of reading matter, hmm? In the three days that followed, I plowed through four mystery magazines, three paperback novels, a lot of back copies of the Wall Street Journal, and all the daily newspapers available, including the funny papers. When Morgan went out to lunch, I went to lunch. When he went home at night to his beautiful place in Upper Montclair, I went along with him. He introduced me to his wife as an old college chum spending a few days in town. But I think Mrs. Morgan kind of wondered why more of our small talk wasn't about the old school tie. She was a lovely woman. I could well understand why Morgan would never want to hurt her. She showed me pictures of the boys. They were good-looking kids, too. Both going to Princeton, both doing very well. But then, the afternoon of the third day, there in the office, came the phone call that we'd been waiting for. At a sign from Mr. Morgan, I carefully picked up the extension phone. Hello? Hello. I'm still on, Henry. Oh, I, uh... You heard a clicking noise while you hung up. And, uh, yeah, listen, Thomas. There's no way you can trace this call. I'm using a dial phone. I'm sure you're prepared for anything, Henry. Exactly. In other words, Thomas, you have no choice but to, uh, shall we say, lend me the money that I need. I know. I know. I'm glad you do. You see, any attempt to call in the police or do me bodily harm can only result in the full story of our... <laughs> of uh, your transgressions being released to the newspapers. Yes, yes, you've made that very clear. But now listen. Well? If I do give you this money... But of course you will. You know very well, Thomas, that you can't afford not to. But what guarantee can I have that you won't be back for more? <laughs> None, Thomas. None whatsoever. Well, you dirty conniving... Now, don't worry, my friend. As long as you make no trouble, I won't be too hard on you. All right. Where do you want it? When? Thomas, I telephoned your wife a few minutes ago. You what? Yes. Henry! I told her I'm an old friend from out of town. Which is quite true, of course. And you told her Oh, about... now, don't be ridiculous, Thomas. I merely told her I'm only here overnight. I'd like to have dinner with you here in town. Oh. That's all. And you see, that will give you the opportunity to meet me this evening, give the money to me, and uh, nobody will suspect a thing. All right. Where and when? Listen carefully, Thomas. I don't want there to be any chance of a slip-up. Now, here is exactly what I want to do. Well, now we know. Yeah, Mr. Morgan. So I'll be leaving you now. Leaving me? But you heard what he's told me to do to meet him tonight with the money. And if I were you, that's just exactly what I would do. But good heavens, Mr. Dollar. Your pal, Wolf, is a real clever fellow. 
And it looks from here as though any interference in this plan of his from anybody can only end up in disaster for you. Well, doesn't it? Yes, yes, of course it does. But you... Well, I thought that somehow you could help me. Just take my advice and be there in Monroe Park tonight and hand over that money to him. So long, Mr. Morgan. No, no, please, please, Mr. Dollar. See you sometime. <laughs> Expense account item two, a dime for a telephone call. And then item three, 1170 for some early cocktails and dinner at the tavern with an old friend of mine, Judge Amos Ordway, retired. The judge had been around for a long time and has a good memory. Yes, Johnny, I recall that investment swindle very well. I was a lawyer then, and some of the people seeking their money back from those two swindlers were clients of mine. Uh, you mean from Henry Wolf and Mr. Thomas? Mm, uh... Thomas. Oh, no, no, no. It was Wolf and a fellow by the name of Danny Fairland. At least, that's what he called himself. Would there still be a case against this Danny Fairland? even if he were calling himself something else now. Well, when the people got their money back, and then some, and withdrew their charges... Well, nonetheless, Judge... Just remember this, Johnny. Laws governing the handling of securities weren't what they are today. Possibly, I say possibly, at that time, that operation could have been construed as being within the law. Uh, barely. But, even more important... Suppose the less guilty of the two, perhaps the one who called himself Danny Fairland, suppose that ever since then he has lived a wholly exemplary life, more than merely made up for his youthful indiscretion. I see. Yes. In other words, you know full well the name of the man who used to call himself Danny Fairland. Now, what are you talking about, Johnny? How could I possibly know anything about him now? I see. Well, thanks. Uh, incidentally, though... Yes, sir. If you should happen to need the services of a good, completely dependable stockbroker here in town, um, may I recommend a man by the name of Thomas R. Morgan? It was after dark by now, but I still had plenty of time. Item four, a dollar even for a cab to the southern edge of Monroe Park. Trying to bribe a certain key from one of the guards about to go off duty wouldn't work. So I did the only thing I could think of at the moment and helped myself to it after roughing him up a little, but then tucking a sawbuck into one of his pockets. As a result, the appointed meeting place, a little tool shed there in a dark, tree-covered corner of the park, held not only me, but the guard. He lay quietly among the rakes and shovels, securely bound and gagged. The time passed slowly. Nine o'clock, ten o'clock. It began to get chilly, uncomfortable, and I began to feel a bit uneasy. Finally, as a distant clock boomed out eleven, I heard footsteps outside the shack. Footsteps of only one, however, pacing slowly back and forth. I hoped it was Thomas Morgan. But what if Wolf played it smart and didn't show? Gently, gently as possible, I opened the door a bit, just a crack. And then I froze because I heard the steps of another man. Hello. Good evening, Thomas. Henry, I didn't think you were coming. You said 11 o'clock. What? What's that? That noise. What? Nothing, nothing. You're late. You didn't think I'd meet you in a place like this without first making certain you hadn't been foolish and tried to bring someone along with you? I wish to heaven I had been able to. In which case, the friend I told you about would release the information in the sealed envelope to the papers. And in 24 hours, you'd be ruined. <laughs> oh, oh, Thomas. Don't ever make... That mistake. You mean if you should do this to me again? Exactly. <laughs> and I probably will. But there's nothing you can do about it. Ever. 
Now, Davy, money, please. Very well, Henry. Here you are. Splendid. Thank you. You know, Thomas. Oh, you aren't going to count it? Or should I? You know, I trust you implicitly. Even as you can trust me. You uh, Now leave by the south gate and go home. I'll just wait here to be sure that you do. Good night, Thomas. Oh, not bad for an evening's work. Not bad is right, buddy. That is for me. I'll take that dough from you. Come on, come on. Thanks. Who are you? Blackmail racket, huh? What are you talking about? What I heard from inside the shack. Put down that gun now and listen to me. No, you listen to me, buddy. You got that poor guy on a string, so maybe I can take him too, huh? You? Sure. Who are you? Somebody's holding some dope on him in a sealed envelope, huh? No. That's what you told him. So if I get the envelope, whatever's in it, I can put the B on him too, huh? No, no, please, you don't understand. No, and whatever it is you know about him, you're doing okay. And now, friend, when you lead me to that envelope, I'll have a racket of my own, right? So, buddy, if you want to stay alive, you take me to that envelope. But there is none. You lying buster. Uh, no, I'm not. Uh, that's the truth. And uh, put that gun away. Now, listen. You don't produce that envelope for me. All I got to do is blow your lying head but off. But I tell you, there is none. That was just a bluff to keep him on the hook. I swear to it. That was only a bluff. You think for a minute I'd ask anyone else in with me on a thing like this? You mean you're just a lone wolf, Mr. Wolf? Believe me, I'm the only one. How do you know my name? It happens to be my job. My name is Johnny Dollar. Investigator? That's right. Your friend Morgan is a client of mine. Oh, I see. Now, shall we take a little walk? Why? Are you kidding? You're all through, Wolf. Am I? You bet you are. That's where you're wrong, daughter. You're forgetting that the only names connected with that stock swindle years ago were yours and that of a man who called himself Danny Fairland. Yes, Danny Listen, Fairland. Listen, if a crook like you tried to claim that today Danny Fairland is somebody else, you think anybody believe you? Yes. Because, Dollar, if I tell what I know... You'll only hang yourself. Not for the swindle that nobody cares about anymore, but for this blackmail bit. As for any tales about the past you might think of telling, you can take my word for it. They'll never hit the papers. You see, I know a judge. Well, Mr. Wolf. Turn him in. Take the chance that he might be able to hurt Thomas Morgan. Or let him go. With the full knowledge that I could prove a charge of blackmail against him. What would you have done? Oh? Well, that's just exactly what I did. Expense account total, including incidentals, eighty-eight forty. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a raging blizzard in the middle of May. And the pure white snow carries the mark of death. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Reddick, is written by Jack Johnstone, produced and directed by Bruno Zerato Jr., musical supervision by Ethel Huber. Heard in our cast were Santos Ortega as Henry B. Wolf, Sam Gray as Thomas Morgan, William Redfield as Harvey Wakeman, Robert Dryden as Judge Amos Ortway. Be sure to join us next week, same time, same station, for another exciting story of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Art Hannah speaking. The laughs are on Arthur Godfrey every weekday on the CBS Radio Network.